All right, we'll wait for about another 30 seconds or a minute. All right, well, let's get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Polariton Chemistry Webinar. My name is Matthew Du, and I'm a grad student in the Well UNO group at University of California, San Diego, and I will be today's host. So before we get started, um, let me make a few announcements. Here is a schedule of upcoming talks for the next several months. Um, we're still booking talks in between in the dates that are not shown here, but yeah, we have a nice lineup coming up. And remember, the webinar is every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, and register at this link here. We also have a Facebook group, a public Facebook group called Polariton Chemistry Online Community, where you can post things like papers, job postings, and more related to Polariton chemistry. So if you haven't signed up for it, um, please do. We also have a YouTube channel for the webinars where we post recordings of um, the webinars and you can access it to rewatch or watch uh, webinars that you've missed. So if you haven't subscribed, uh, please do so. Now, let's discuss the mechanics of the webinar. During the webinar, you have three options, which are shown at the bottom of the screen. You have chat, raise hand, and Q&A. Use the chat if you want to chat with the panelists or other audience members. If you want to ask a question during the talk, click raise hand, and then at an appropriate time, I'll ask the speaker to pause, and then I'll unmute you, and then you can ask your question. You can also type in questions in the Q&A. At the end of the talk, we will address those questions, and then if we don't get to them, um, we'll ask the speaker to answer them, and then we'll post the answers to those Q&A questions in the comment section of the recording posted on YouTube. All right, so now let me introduce today's speaker, Professor Jonathan Foley from William Patterson University. Professor Jay Foley earned his master's and PhD at the University of Chicago under the advising of Professor David Mazziotti. In his graduate research, Professor Foley used two electron reduced density matrix methods in the context of organic radical reactions and quantum state tomography. He then did a postdoc at Argonne National Lab under the guidance of Professor Stephen Gray. Professor Foley's postdoctoral research was focused on modeling surface plasmons, especially those formed at metal-metal interfaces. In 2015, he started his independent career as an assistant professor at William Patterson University. His research group is interested in polariton chemistry, as well as the virtual design of materials with tailored thermal, optical, and catalytic properties. Professor Foley is also active in chemical education through research and other activities and co-hosts a very nice podcast called The Gopert Mayor Gage, which intertwines discussion about science and music. During his academic career, he has received several honors in teaching, education, and service. So without further ado, let me give the stage to Professor Jonathan Foley, who will be talking about the role of cavity losses on non-adiabatic couplings and dynamics in polaritonic chemistry. Professor Foley, you may now share your screen. Okay. 
Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, this is um, so fantastic to be here um, giving the, uh, the Flaritonic Chemistry webinar today. Um, I'm just such a huge fan of this series. Um, as I have discussed on uh, the, web, the podcast that Matt mentioned, uh, and I just want to do one further plug. So this is a new kind of a joint newish uh, endeavor with me and a longtime friend and collaborator, Dugan Hayes. That's another light matter enthusiast. And we actually just released an episode on Maria Geppert Meyer, which is uh, was really fantastic to learn something about her. So, so uh, let me just plug that. But uh, yeah, so I'm um, Jay Foley. I'm at William Patterson University, and um, and I want to talk a, a little bit about um, our efforts, which are quite new uh, for us in platonic chemistry, or I should say, you know, so, so fairly recent. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. And I, I just want to thank Matt again for inviting me and Hoel and Wei for organizing this fantastic uh, series. It's been just such a great thing to uh, feel connected with this community and, and learn a lot along the way. So let me start by acknowledging uh, my group and some funding sources. So the Flaritonic work, in fact, um, was uh, uh, funded by the Research Corp. And it kind of followed on some projects funded by the PRF. And we've been able to do a lot of simulations uh, because of user proposals with the Department of Energy and then the Mercury Consortium. So all of those things have been tremendously helpful. And my department here at William Patterson has also been tremendously helpful. So this is a, a you know classic Zoom uh, grid of the group as it is today, and uh, the folks in blue, uh, uh, Penny and Fegan and James, uh, were very central in the story that I'll tell you today about the um, uh, connection between uh, photonic losses and the resulting dynamics of platonic systems. And uh, some of the uh, preceding work uh, involved uh, some earlier students that I had there, now all alums, uh, Jason and Kim and Noor and Matt. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, folks that, that I won't talk about their work so much today, but are still uh, uh, involved in either um, platonic connections or um, thermal radiation work are uh, Jose and uh, Alyssa and Ben and John, and some of the things that they're doing that are related to this is, is working on some ab initio uh, electronic structure methods for computing platonic potential energy services. So I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, let's say by summer, we'll have some, um, um, you know, open source uh, sci 4 implementations of, uh, of some of these methods that can hopefully be useful for the community for computing platonic potential energy services. But I won't talk about any of that today. Uh, and then uh, I like to show a picture of my daughter usually because it makes me happy. But also in this particular case, I really started kind of thinking about platonic chemistry the summer that I was taking my paternity leave when she was born. And I didn't really learn a lot about platonic chemistry at that time because I was just trying to survive but, uh, and stay, you know, live on two hours of sleep or whatever. But, uh, but I did start reading some papers uh, written by a lot of the folks that have been instrumental in this series. And, and eventually they you know, started to stick and we started to think of some questions and I'll talk about that today. Um, okay, so, um, so to sort of segue into the direct story, I wanna talk about a system, uh, if I can get my mouse up, um, which got us thinking about this lifetime um, of photonic resonances um, you know, very actively. And so this is actually an experimental uh, system that um, that uh, a, a long, a pretty long time collaborator of mine and Stevens uh, and Yu Gang uh, actually made, and he had these uh, structures, which are some sometimes called these dielectric core metal satellite structures. They basically, in this case, are glass, you know, rather large bead decorated with very very small metals. Uh, but they can be, you know, realized in a, a variety of different contexts with a variety of different materials. But the fundamental pieces are a fairly large dielectric core, so something that's optically transparent, decorated with very small metals. And so those two materials have very different optical properties. But there's an interesting interplay that gave rise to um, the optical properties of those materials, as well as some photocatalytic activity. So I just want to kind of talk about that 
uh, very briefly and, and, um, and make the connection to what I'll talk about today. So this is just a simulation of, of um, hitting that uh, dielectric nanomarble with the pulse of light. And so what you can see is that, um, you know, some of that light ends up getting trapped in this marble and you can kind of see these uh, orbits, like these uh, circular orbits that the uh, wave packets are taking within the marble. And so those are coming, these are the so-called scattering resonances that this uh, marble supports. And um, <clears throat> you can, you know, resolve those scattering resonances and, uh, and frequency or a wavelength if you like. And so this is basically a map of the electric field of one of those resonances. It's a, you know, the kind of the green contribution to the scattering of this uh, structure. And so you can see the, the electric field pattern shows this you know, intensity uh, distribution where most of the, elec the electric field intensity is concentrated near the surface, right? Just beneath the surface of the nanomarble. And so this is an example of a particular kind of resonance, which is usually called a whispering gallery mode. And it's uh, just an optical analogy of something that's been known in acoustics for a very long time. And you know, if you've ever been in a circular cathedral, which they sometimes call these whispering galleries, you can you know, have a friend stand on one side and you stand on the other and you kind of like whisper against the wall and your friend hears you very, very loud and clear because the, there's acoustic resonances in those structures that, that support the transfer of those waves. So, um, okay, so what's so interesting about those are useful is that if you, if, if you think about the, those resonances in conjunction with these hybrid structures, um, with the satellites of these small metal nanoparticles, then those metal satellites um, um, are placed in a very close vicinity with these uh, very uh, intense electromagnetic resonances, right, where the electric field is concentrated. So they have additional opportunities to absorb um, light that, that they wouldn't have in sort of a free space context. And so to illustrate this point, what I, what I have here uh, in black down at the bottom, and I'll switch back to my laser, is uh, the scattering spectrum of a, of a, uh, of a nanomarble. Um, and you can see a bunch of distinct peaks and each peak is, is one of these scattering resonances. And then um, above, to take your attention to the top panel here, I have the absorption spectrum of three different uh, lone metal satellites. Um, one made of gold and black here, one made of silver and purple here, and then a platinum one and an iron one, which are shown in the dashed lines down here. And in the original uh, structures that you gang made, the satellites were platinum, but you could imagine a variety of different metals. But the important thing is that the, the platinum and the iron satellite structures alone, they don't have any strong absorption features in the visible, right? They just kind of have this baseline absorption. And of course, the silver and the gold, they have very strong absorption resonances that are owing to their uh, localized surface plasma resonances. Um, so now when you actually take the absorption spectrum of the composite structure, which is the dielectric core and the satellites, the absorption spectrum strongly mimics the scattering uh, spectrum of the underlying dielectric core. So this is just uh, you know, um, um, consistent with this notion that these scattering resonances really facilitate the absorption of light of the satellite structures. And so we call this um, scattering mediated absorption and, and, um, and we uh, have thought about uh, this phenomenon in, a, in a, a handful of different contexts. And uh, of course, one of the things that, one of the contexts we wanted to think about was actually coupling these, uh, these uh, optical resonances to, uh, to molecules, to uh, molecular chromophores. And, um, and so what's, what is you know, kind of compelling about that system is, the, is this really incredible tunability that you have with those resonances. Right, because they, they mimic the underlying scattering and the scattering is so tunable just by the, the, the geometry and composition of the dielectric. Right, so the, the kind of parameter space that you can think of is like the, what's the refractive index of the core, right? You could go glass, which is kind of low refractive index. You could go like titanium dioxide, which is kind of high and all these other materials in between. And that's one parameter. And then also just the geometry of the core. And through those two parameters, you can really have a lot of control over the energy of those resonances, their intensities, and, and their lifetimes. So I didn't really point it out in the movie, but those wave fronts continued to kind of circulate for a very long time, you know, hundreds 
many hundreds of femtoseconds in some cases, perhaps even longer if you make really, really um, special resonators. So the lifetimes can be quite long compared to like a plasma resonance on a, on a lone metal nanoparticle. And so we really focused on the impact of that lifetime on, um, on um, a resonance energy transfer, which would be like a weak coupling of, the, of a chromophore to these optical resonances and showed that the lifetime was very important. And that was a collaboration with uh, Eugene de Prince, um, another longtime friend, and then several of my students, Matt and Noor that I mentioned earlier. And, um, and that was kind of the segue into this uh, question about, well, okay, well, let's make the coupling stronger, right? And, and, and sort of ask a similar question, how is the lifetime important? And so that's, that's basically the story that I'm gonna tell you today. Again, uh, uh, Penny and Fegan and James were really central in this work of, of understanding um, uh, the role of the photonic lifetime in the context of a, um, uh, a molecular chromophore, in this case, it's modeled after the azobenzene molecule, which can undergo a photoisomerization, and which I'll show you in a few slides, um, has also been looked at you know, in a handful of different contexts for, for strong coupling to photons. Um, and so you know, in those contexts, of course, it's, it's been um, you know, very, very um, uh, interestingly described how you can modify the relevant potential energy surfaces for isomerization by strong coupling to the photon. So you get these emergent potential energy surfaces um, that can be modified through both the, cav the, the photon energy and the, the coupling strength. But in addition, it turns out that you can further modify these potential energy surfaces through the, the, the lifetime of those photons. Um, and then other things that are really important for the dynamics, um, including these non adiabatic couplings, are also impact. Uh, professor, uh, we have a question from the yes. audience. Uh, hi, G, uh, sorry, may you clarify something uh, about uh, the these nanoparticles on top of the dielectric structure? So the nanoparticles can be just uh, irregularly placed on top of the... Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so actually, in this, these particular structures, uh, they can be pretty uniformly distributed because this is like an electrostatic self-assembly process. So, you know, you have like complementary charge between the surface of the dielectric and the metals. So the metals kind of like to stay fairly far apart, but then they stick to the dielectric. Okay. But, uh, but you, you probably can do some things to, you know, have irregular patterning, patterning as well. Um, but, but uh, are, are, are these things only in spherical, uh, so, so, so these whispering gallery modes, are they only in this uh, very perfectly spherical uh, uh, TiO2 uh, substrate? Yeah, or, they, are no, <laughs> they can also be realized in like toroids. Um, and they can certainly be realized in toroids. I think if you start to really distort um, uh, this, you know, away from a, at least, um, you know, one uh, uh, kind of circular um, uh, degree of freedom, then I think, I think eventually you will not realize those, um, those whispering gallery modes, uh, right? Because they, they, they are, you know, very much akin to these, uh, you know, spherical harmonic um, solutions. But for example, if the nanoparticle is, well, sorry, if the substrate is, has sharp edges or things like that, does that destroy the, the resonances or do they survive? Yeah, so I guess it depends on how bad the imperfections are. So they, they can actually survive pretty, uh, they, they can survive um, some imperfections on the surface. Okay. Um, at some point, uh, imperfections will do, I, I think actually the, before you really, your imperfections take you away from spherical geometry, I think what will happen is that the imperfections will themselves sort of be like, uh, um, you know, these uh, scattering um, um, centers that would sort of couple the mode to the far field. So I think you would end up like leaking your, uh, your, your photons away um, because of those imperfections before you distort it away from a sphere. That's kind of my feeling about it, but I don't. I guess just like your nanoparticles that you are just depositing 
on top of them here. Yeah. Okay. Ah, right. Maybe another question. I don't know if I'm putting questions in your mouth. If if I made the the satellites too big, um, mm -hmm. I would probably start to ruin the the resonances as well. I mean, I certainly would. At a certain point, I would start to ruin those resonances. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. Awesome. Um, yeah. Okay. So so let me get into to this, and I just want to also say that. Um, that um, uh, it's, it's perhaps a bit morose to say that we were all thinking about loss a lot in 2020, but it is seems to be empirically true that we were. Um, there's quite a good number of papers that, uh, that are kind of contemporaneous or came out right before our paper or came out since that, that deal with this uh, dissipation in platonic chemistry, uh, including one uh, with Matt and Jorge and Hoel, uh, which actually looks at it in, um, vibrational strong coupling, which is very cool. Um, uh, I, uh, we write, as we were thinking about this, uh, how to treat the dissipation, uh, we found this paper by uh, Stephen and uh, Chris and Matt Auden, uh, Chris Cortez and Matt Auden. I saw them in the audience, which is why I'm being very familiar with them, on uh, a non-Hermitian approach to coupling plasmons to quantum dots. Um, and this is also another example, which uh, came from Johannes Weiss group, the one that I'm illustrating here, which is uh, actually exploiting dissipation in a very cool way to en enhance the uh, photo dissociation of H2. So there's been a lot of, I think, interesting thought um, uh, recently on the role of dissipation um, and incorporating them in, in some kind of cool ways into these kinds of calculations. So, so hopefully um, you'll find some good reading material if you haven't already encountered those. Those papers. So let me describe this uh, system in a little bit more detail that we're modeling. So, um, so this is the azobenzene molecule. This is an illustration of azobenzene in a cavity. And, um, and azobenzene is kind of a you know, prototype type uh, photochemistry system. Right? It's got this uh, cis isomer over here and a trans isomer over here. And you access the isomerization through this rotation about this dihedral angle, which I'm denoting R. And there's a very high barrier to this rotation on the ground state. You have to break at least a single, you know, at least one double bond. I don't know, maybe two or something like that. So it's um, so it's very high barrier to isomerization on the ground state. Um, <clears throat> on the first excited state, right, you break that relevant bond or at least weaken sufficiently, and you kind of have this. Uh, this potential energy surface along the isomerization coordinate, which has a uh, minimum that sits right at the sort of transition state geometry between cis and trans. So on the excited state, you know, you're, you can, um, your nuclear wave packet can kind of traverse this uh, barrierless um, uh, region and relax and uh, fall back down to the ground state. And, you know, you would imagine that it has pretty much a 50-50 chance of having forward momentum and becoming trans or backwards and having cis, and that's approximately what you see. Um, and then, um, so what is cool though, is um, if you have um, this molecule strongly coupled to a photon, which is approximately resonant to this transition, um, then you can really modify the shapes of these potential energy surfaces. And this is the what, um, uh, Frank Ho and Arkajit Mandel um, discussed uh, very beautifully in their paper uh, a couple of years ago. And so they actually mapped out quite a few different coupling conditions where um, you could realize um, these uh, polaritonic potential energy surfaces such that if you started, you know, uh, your nuclear wave packet up here, you could skate down here and have a nice transition uh, uh, between the upper polariton and lower polariton state, continue to skate down and, and fall basically into this basin, which uh, holds you in the trans configuration. And under other different coupling conditions to the photon, you can basically split those surfaces sufficiently that you no longer have this non-adiabatic coupling between the surfaces that's, that's appreciable. And so you kind of get locked into this basin here, that, which sits above the cis and eventually relax down to the ground state and, and stay cis. So, um, so this is just kind of a map of that, of the reaction yields as a function of the cavity coupling strength with a, with a, a photon energy fixed at that resonance that I mentioned before. So you can see there's this region which is extremely facile towards the, the cis to trans isomerization, and then a region with stronger coupling strength with those 
level, those surfaces are split sufficiently, which, which is very um, suppressive of the assisted trans isomerization. Okay. And so, um, so then, you know, essentially our question um, is, uh, you know, going to be looking at that same system, but just addressing the impact of the photonic lifetime as one additional parameter to consider. And, um, and so, you know, I think um, in the context of the particles that I showed you before, right, the lifetime is kind of related to how long will the photon, you know, continue to circulate in that structure and, and exchange between the metal site, which is where it's sort of localized and interacts with the molecular system or, you know, in the traditional cavity case, it's like how long before the photon couples to the, the, uh, the universe outside and leaks away. So all these different systems, right, can have a variety of different uh, photonic lifetimes, right, uh, rates of dissipation. So how do we actually uh, incorporate this? Am I actually blocking out part of my screen? I wonder. Hopefully not. Anyway, no, I'm not. This yeah, I, I can see everything. So okay, great. It's good to me. Um, so this is basically the um, the Hamiltonian that we we use for the polaritonic structure. Um, which is, you know, almost identical to um, the Hamiltonian from um, uh, Frank and uh, Arkhajit's paper. So we've got this molecular electronic contribution, and this just defines the ground state and uh, excited state potential energy surfaces along the reaction coordinate, which we call G, um, you know, ket G and ket E. Um, we've got this photonic contribution, right, which uh, contains the energy of the photon, but also contains the uh, dissipation rate. So it incorporates the finite lifetime. And so this is a complex, basically a complex energy attributed to the photon, which makes this Hamiltonian non-Hermitian. And then we have a coupling between the photon and the molecule. And so without that coupling, right, then the dynamics would be governed by the shapes of the, the E surface or the G surface. And with the coupling, the dynamics would be governed by the features of the uh, this so-called upper polariton and lower polariton surfaces. So, um, so we, we're basically gonna uh, define those surfaces by building um, our uh, Hamiltonian matrix in some basis and then diagonalizing it. So this is the basis that we are building it in. We've got a, a basis state, which is considering the molecule in its ground state and no photon in the cavity. So that's G0. Um, we've got a, a basis state G1, which I've illustrated by highlighting the cavity. So now you've got a photon in the cavity, but the molecule is still in the ground state. Um, you've got your molecule in an excited state and no photon in the cavity. So now you see the molecules highlighted. And then um, the state where you've got molecule in an excited state and the photon in the cavity. So both are highlighted. And so um, that coupling term in the Hamiltonian primarily will mix together uh, this G1 state and the E0 state. So the ground state and one, one photon in the cavity and molecule in the excited state, no photon in the cavity. So there's a lot of mixing between those states, uh, particularly in the regions of the pot potential energy surface where the ground to excited state transition is nearly equal to the photon energy. And so in those regions, of course, there's a lot of exchange between uh, the uh, photon um, being absorbed by the molecule and then the photon being emitted and, and uh, trapped in the cavity. And um, that dissipation term that we have, I should say, um, only uh, uh, touches the cavity. So we, we treat the molecular excited state to have an infinite lifetime and then the dissipation basically sucks the photon from the cavity out into the universe. So that Hamiltonian matrix uh, in that basis just has this form. So we've got along the diagonal, you've got the, um, the molecular uh, um, uh, ground and excited state energies as a function of the reaction coordinate. And on this, uh, this uh, anti-diagonal, you have the couplings and then you also have these um, complex photon frequencies. Okay, so just to show you um, one feature um, that comes about when you uh, diagonalize these matrices and build the potential energy surfaces from the eigenvalue. So these are the upper and lower polariton surfaces for two different cases, um, exactly the same uh, photon energy, which is a, a roughly two and a half electron volts, exactly the same coupling strength, Hg, which is about 0.02 electron volts. 
So I don't think I said this, but those were both taken to be the regions that were highly facile for assisted trans isomerization in the, in the um, uh, work I showed from um, uh, uh, Frank Ho and uh, Arkishi before, but we added this uh, finite lifetime. So when the, uh, this low dissipation rate, so H bar gamma, pretty small, um, I can zoom in in this region of the potential energy surface and I see this um, avoided crossing here. Um, and uh, there's color coding of these surfaces as well. The purple means I'm mostly exotonic in nature. The red means I'm mostly photonic in nature. And the cyan means a strong mixed character. And so you can see that you know, right near the avoided crossing, I have a strong mixing of the photonic and exotonic character. And then if I crank the dissipation way up, I no longer see an avoided crossing. The curves actually cross and the mixed nature of those, of those states is, is strongly diminished. So that's already kind of a gross difference between the surfaces that appears when you include the dissipation. Uh, so, uh, yes. Uh, we, we actually have a question um, in the, the chat uh, from Eric Fisher. Uh, do you see the question or would you like me to read it? Oh. Uh, yeah, if you don't, sorry, if you don't mind reading yeah, it. Yeah, for sure. So uh, Eric asked, does the interaction contribution of the light matter Hamiltonian take into account the nuclear coordinate dependence of the electronic transition dipole moment? It doesn't. That's a very good question. Um, it does not. And the reason we neglected it, so it, I, I, uh, I am certainly aware that this is this would be important, but actually the um, the, the regions of interest uh, um, of the nuclear coordinate where uh, for that cavity photon energy um, uh, that really induces the coupling, the dipole moment is, is quite strong in that, re in that region. Uh, the transition dipole moment is quite strong in that region. So, so having a fixed dipole coupling as a function of the nuclear coordinate shouldn't really impact the results. And um, I, I, we did not, do a Carroll study of that, but I would refer you to that uh, paper by uh, Arkajit Mandel and Frank Ho, where they, they did actually ex explore that explicitly and, and with the same conclusions. So, good question. Okay, cool. Good to move on? Yep, go ahead. Okay. So, um, so this is a plot of the isomerization yield as a function of the um, dissipation rate for fixed cavity uh, photon energy and coupling strength as, as mentioned before. And so as we, as we um, on the left-hand side, we're really, really small dissipation or really long lifetime. So lifetimes on the top, if you like that better in picoseconds and dissipation rates on the bottom in milli electron volts. So on the left-hand side, you know, basically we're going to higher and higher trans isomerization yield. Um, and in this intermediate region, this intermediate loss region, what we see that um, is actually a really strong suppression of the isomerization. Um, so in fact, there's almost no cis to trans isomerization in this intermediate region. And in this high loss region, we go back to a nearly 50-50 yield of the cis and trans isomer. So just to illustrate this schematically, the kind of characteristic trajectories in, the, in this low loss are very much like what I described in the, in the beginning, which is that I, start, I can start on the upper polariton, I can skate down with a non-adiabatic transition to this lower polariton region and continue downhill and eventually relax into the ground state. In the moderate loss region, I get trapped in this basin and relax down to the ground state. And so I'm locked in cis. And in the very high loss region, I actually um, remain. Uh, so, so there's no longer, so actually this purple curve is entirely really um, a single state. So it's no longer, uh, I don't know, upper and lower polariton. It's not really the correct characterization, I guess. I stay on the state and I kind of skate in this um, in this barrierless uh, region until I relax and then I'm almost 50-50. So this high loss is actually very analogous to the standard photochemistry. And I wanna just take a minute to say how we uh, simulated those isomerization yields. So we, we took a mixed uh, quantum classical approach um, as opposed to these fully quantum uh, approaches um, um, that 
that uh, had been done in the and and some of the other work I mentioned. Um, so the nuclear degrees of freedom are treated classically, and the electronic and photonic are treated quantum mechanically. And so in this case, we basically have a uh, Langevin equation for our nuclear coordinate, and we uh, include this Langevin, uh, you know, random force and and frictional term. Uh, to model the vibrational relaxation, because we only have a single nuclear degree of freedom, so there's no, you know, coupling to other nuclear degrees of freedom to, to accomplish the uh, vibrational relaxation. So that's sort of a, accomplished phenomenologically with this frictional term. Um, the actual forces uh, coming from the polaritonic surfaces um, are defined um, as follows, basically this hellman feynman uh, force with the derivative of the Hamiltonian acting on the polaritonic uh, eigenstates. And um, at the same time that we're evolving the nuclei, we're evolving a wave function for the uh, um, uh, electron, uh, electronic state and the photonic states. And so we've got this polaritonic Hamiltonian, which again is a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. So it's connecting those uh, um, occupied photon states um, to, uh, uh, to a loss. Uh, it's, it's dissipating occupation out of the photonic states. Um, and also there is a derivative coupling contribution to that um, uh, Schrodinger equation, which, which induces transitions between the polaritonic states. So the, the derivative coupling has these terms. So basically a derivative, you know, I could define the uh, lower polariton, upper polariton derivative coupling as the uh, spatial derivative of the upper polariton state projected onto the lower polariton state. So that's our approach. It's an adaptation of Hughes switches surface hopping, which I think I showed a reference that contemporaneously uh, Mario Barbati's group also introduced a complex surface hopping approach and did some really very cool things with it. Our, ours, our approach is a little bit more, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, primitive than his, um, but, but still it was fun. Okay. So I, wanted, I actually wanna go into a little bit of detail about what's happening to those surfaces because I, I mentioned um, a few things that impacted the dynamics and I kind of want to explain um, the origins of those um, in, in hopefully somewhat uh, um, uh, simple terms in the remaining time. So, um, so we saw in this local loss case that there was an avoided crossing in this region of the potential energy surface between the upper and the lower polariton uh, surfaces. And if we crank the, um, dissipation way up, we didn't see that um, avoided crossing, right? We saw the curves intersect. So you can actually uh, think about, you know, that particular position, right? Right at the avoided crossing, that's, that happens to occur at the geometry where the uh, electronic transition is exactly in resonance with the photon. So you can think about this in terms of this James Cumming model, where you have a single quantum, a two level quantum system coupled to a photon. And then the eigenvalues of that, um, of that coupled system you know, have this form. So you've got omega, which would be the frequency of the photon and the frequency associated with the transition. Um, this gamma term is the lifetime of the photon. And again, there would be a uh, lifetime for the molecular transition, but we make it infinite, so, there, so it's not in this equation. Uh, G is the coupling between the two. Um, and so what you can see is that, um, you know, uh, with G being larger, or sorry, gamma, no, G being uh, large compared to gamma, you end up with a positive um, argument to the square root, which gives you a, a real splitting in the eigenvalues. And that splitting vanishes exactly when, uh, the gamma value is equal to G, four times G. So when the dissipation rate becomes commensurate with the, uh, with the coupling strength, then this splitting vanishes. And then, so this is, um, you know, probably many of you are familiar that this is typically associated with the onset of strong coupling, right? Gamma being larger than four G. So when gamma is equal to four G, basically the strong coupling, uh, you know, vanishes, right? There's no splitting. But if you continue to crank gamma beyond 4G, right, what happens is you end up with a negative number in the square root. So now your eigenvalues are actually split in, in their negative energy contributions. So, so although we see no splitting in the, in the surfaces here, right, we see a crossing in real space, in the imaginary energy space, there's actually a splitting. 
And so this uh, figure over here is just a map of you know, th um, the, the difference between the upper uh, Plariton eigenvalue and lower Plariton eigenvalue as we kind of crank through different values of the coupling strength and the dissipation. And so you can see that you, know, you can have many, many regions of negative energy splitting and real energy splitting and blah, blah, blah. Um, I just wanted to highlight the specific range of parameters of our work, which is in this white dashed era. So you can see like near the, the, the large end of our dissipation that we consider, we're, we're kind of beyond um, strong coupling vanishing and we're into this negative energy splitting. Um, at the same time, um, you can think about what happens to the derivative coupling, right? The forces that drive the transitions between those upper and lower polariton states. And um, for reasons which I will further elaborate on, this is going to be an approximate statement that the derivative coupling is approximately equal to this again, hellman feynman like um, term, where I've got the derivative of my Hamiltonian acting on an upper polariton state projected onto a lower polariton state. And that is all divided by the, the, the energy splitting right, between the upper and the lower polariton. So you'd imagine as, as I start to diminish that splitting that the, the magnitude of that coupling should go way up. Um, and it does, um, but if I crank the dissipation large enough and get beyond that gamma equals 4G, um, the, actually the derivative coupling uh, approaches zero quite quickly. So we see like a big rise in the derivative coupling as I crank up the dissipation uh, to a certain point and then it, um, and then it dies, it decays very quickly to, a very, to, to negligible values. So one of the things that happens is that basically with large enough dissipation rates, you don't have coupling, derivative couplings between those surfaces. Hey, uh, uh, Professor? Yes. Uh, we actually have a question regarding your uh, method on the previous slide. So this is in the yeah. chat um, from Garrett Fronhoff. So okay. their question is, in the surface hopping simulations, does R represent the 3n dimensional vector of azobenzene atoms or only the reaction coordinate? Yeah, only the reaction coordinate. And, and this is why we used this um, Langevin equation, uh, right? If we had a higher dimensional uh, um, uh, space, then we would have, you know, real um, vibrational relaxation, but we don't. We ju we're just considering the motion along that one dimensional uh, isomerization coordinate. So we included um, this frictional term in the random force to sort of mimic vibrational relaxation. Oh, and actually we, uh, we have another question that just popped mm -hmm. up in the chat from Claudia. So the question is, why do you consider E comma one, the state E comma one in your basis? That's a fantastic question. Uh, we probably don't need it. Uh, I, I, I am almost certain we don't need it. I think, I don't know why we included it. It's probably, it's, yeah, it's probably superfluous. It doesn't couple to any of the states in, in, that, we, that we look at the dynamics on. So it's a very good question. I don't have a good answer for it. It's superfluous. <laughs> Uh, all, right. all right. Yeah, I guess. Thank you. Answered all the questions. So yeah. <laughs> I hope, that, I hope, that, hope that answer is satisfactory. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so okay. Um, so this figure right here. So I I wanted to focus a little bit more on this imaginary energy splitting um, to hopefully rationalize um, one of the reasons why um, we see such strong suppression of the isomerization in the moderate loss. And I have to confess this, I don't really like this figure and I just haven't thought of a better way to represent this, but, but these are the um, imaginary parts of the upper and lower polariton surfaces for various different dissipation rates. So green is the smallest dissipation rate, red is the largest, 10 is intermediate, and the dashed line is the lower polariton state and the solid line is the upper polariton. So I'm gonna tr hopefully try to um, skate through this um, without confusing people too much. So um, the green surface, the, the lowest dissipation where the isomerization is pretty facile. What we see is that depending on where you are on the nuclear coordinate, which is 
this x-axis. Um, uh, one state or the other tends to have most of the loss associated with it. So on the far left of the reaction coordinate, the lower plariton is the lossiest. And then there's a crossover because there's a crossing in imaginary space. And then the upper plariton inherits more of the loss. But this is very small loss. So 10 to the, you know, this is like uh, 10 to the minus four um, um, a, a value of, um, of the dissipation rate. So it's, it's, rel it's relatively small. So it's, it's, I guess I should say it's negligible on the time scale of the isomerization. Okay, um, if I go up to um, moderate loss, okay, um, same kind of story, right? The lower plariton surface is lossier on the left side of the reaction coordinate. And then there's a crossover near that avoided crossing in real space where they start to hand off. And this is one of the reasons why it's so hard to um, it's so hard to isomerize in this case because essentially um, the the nuclear degree of freedom experiences the loss, um, which is substantial on the time scale of the isomerization um, at some point on that trajectory. Right? It's either going to experience it um, because it uh, was on the upper plariton surface on the right hand side of the avoided crossing, or because it switched the lower plariton surface uh, on the on the left side. So it experience it, so the nuclear wave packet tends to experience pretty substantial loss in the process of trying to transit from the upper to the lower lower plariton surface, and then if I crank the the loss even higher, then um, again thinking about this Jane's coming model, you predict that there's a splitting in the imaginary energy space. So what that means is that the lower plariton state remain it retains the majority of the loss throughout the potential energy surface, and so that means that actually the the nuclear um, uh, wave function doesn't feel the loss very substantially as it transits on the potential energy surface that it that it starts on, which looks a lot like that um, standard excited state potential energy surface of azobenzene. Okay, um, so so I think that is sort of um, hopefully tying together the story from before. And let me just um, let me just reiterate with these pictures, right? So low loss. I can I, I have non-adiabatic transitions between upper and lower plariton surfaces, and I can survive the trajectory all the way over to this side. So I can make it to the trans configuration with pretty high likelihood. With moderate loss, I can experience I I I, I can experience dissipation to the ground state if I hit this part of the upper plariton surface, which is red, or if I hit this part of the lower plariton surface, which is red. Or I can even experience loss in the in the uh, the cyan region because then I have shared loss. So this tends to trap you in the cis configuration because you just can't make it past. And then the high coupling or the high loss region, um, uh, the purple curve is basically protected from the loss and it is not coupled strongly to the red curve. So that means you just traverse a potential energy surface which looks an awful lot like the lone azobenzene excited state. So that's, um, I think, the main part of the story, but I just wanted to add one additional detail in here because I know many people in this audience are technical. Right, hey, uh, so. Professor? Yes, go ahead. Actually, I have a question about the previous slide and the yes. case uh, high loss. Yes. So I, I guess I would like some intuition about why when you're on when you start on the upper plariton, you're immune to the loss because isn't it true that you, that molecular degree of freedom is still coupled, right, with the strong coupling? Well, to the degree of freedom. Yeah. So okay. So the our uh, our Hamiltonian um, because we only have a finite lifetime for the photon. Um, if the if the G1 and E0 states are not strongly coupled, then um, then that mean and, and, and so I guess what I what I should say is that um, in the very high loss case, two things happen. One is that the E E0 and G1 states are not strongly coupled anymore. Um, and and you can you can think about that maybe from a variety of different ways. Uh, 
for a variety of different reasons. But one is that there, you, all of a sudden there's just a lot of energy uncertainty with a photon, right? The, in, the, the lifetime is very, very short. There's a great deal of energy uncertainty in the photon, which, is, which kind of makes the strong coupling a bit of a mess. Maybe a, that is to some extent reflected in the eigenvalues of the Jane's coming model as well. So the, so the surfaces are not coupled together, right? The derivative couplings are also astonishingly small. So there's, so in many ways, they're, they're not coupled together. And so what that means is that what I'm calling the upper polariton curve is predominantly just the, the, the E0 curve. So it, is, it, it doesn't have a photonic contribution. And in our model, the only dissipation uh, um, in the um, original basis is connected to the photon. The pho photon being occupied. It's not connected to the excited state of the molecule. OK, yeah, the, the comment about the uncertainty definitely gave me some intuition. So okay, uh, thanks. And actually, I have one more question. Uh, yeah. So I know in the weak coupling regime, when you know the dissipation is comparable or higher than the light matter coupling, right? You, people see the Purcell effect, right, where energy can go from the you know, unidirectionally from the emitter to the photon, and then that's end of story, right? And I know yeah. there have been some work showing that even in the weak coupling regime, you can modify the chemical reactivity. So I'm just wondering, like, which of your regimes that you showed here would or could correspond yeah. to the weak coupling regime, the Purcell effect regime? Well, okay, for sure, the high loss case is really weak coupling. And, th and this is something that I think is like very misleading about how I have these figures labeled. And because I, I, I'm still calling it strong coupling because I haven't changed the magnitude of the coupling parameter. Um, but I think it is certainly fair to say that this is no longer strong coupling because gamma uh, is larger than four times the coupling strength. So I think we're clearly not in strong coupling anymore. So that I would, I would guess this is very much like weak coupling. But that, but then this doesn't have any suppression relative to the lone molecular case, really. It's actually quite, quite analogous to the lone molecular case. So I don't know the answer to your question. I, I guess I'm gonna have to think about it a little bit. But what what is most similar to the suppression is this moderate case. So I don't know, I'm gonna have to think about that. Maybe we can chat offline. About it. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay. I just wanted to say one more kind of technical thing before I wrap up and hopefully I have time. Um, so that's about the approximate nature of this expression, which I mentioned, and it, I'll, I'll just be very quick about it because I see we're almost out of time. Um, so one, one thing is when you have this non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, your, your eigenstates are not necessarily orthogonal anymore. So this is actually a map of the projection of the upper polariton state on the lower polariton state across the uh, uh, reaction coordinate. And when there's no loss, it's always zero. They're always orthogonal. When there is loss, uh, and they can be very non-orthogonal, um, and particularly when there's strong coupling. So, um, so you know, I, I did, I'm only putting this in because I didn't know all this stuff. Like a couple of years ago, I didn't ever study non-adiabatic um, dynamics or anything. So I never thought about derivative couplings, but this expression, Right, comes from a perturbative um, expansion. And then with an orthogonal basis, there are no additional terms, right? You just have this Hellman Feynman like term, which is exactly equal to the left hand side. But in a non orthogonal basis, this is not the end. So there's actually a quantitative, you know, very striking difference between applying this Hellman Feynman like um, uh, expression for the derivative coupling and actually taking the derivative of, of your upper polariton eigenstate and projecting onto the lower. And that's what's shown here, it's a big difference. So, so you, could, you could be very wrong if you use this expression. Okay, um, all right. So that's, um, I think just to summarize, um, hopefully I've convinced you that there's um, interesting impacts on polaritonic uh, uh, structure and dynamics uh, when loss of the photonic degrees of freedom is incorporated. Um, and so, you know, simulation methodology, methodologies, uh, I think um, uh, there's an important role for incorporating loss and in, in, in more uh, meaningful ways into these kinds of simulations. And I want to thank you all again for your attention and uh, Matt and Huel and Wei for um, inviting me and hosting this amazing uh, forum. Thank you. All right. Well, let's thank Professor Foley for a wonderful talk. And now we will open the floor the questions. 
So, uh, well, has another question. So. Hi, Jay. Okay, so first of all, uh, two very quick uh, comments and questions. So the first one, I think regarding the Purcell effect, I do think that that depends on, that, that, that is your moderate uh, loss case. As I, I agree with your statement. I think in the case of the very strong loss, I think, well, for the Purcell effect to be uh, operating, I think you need uh, the resonance of the cavity to be parked. Uh, you know, th there needs to be a high density of states at the transition that you are interested in, right? So in the case of the strong loss, then your um, your density of, of states is spread out throughout a large window of energy. That's the way I would think about it. I don't know if you agree with that. Uh, yeah. ju ju just paraphrasing what you already said. Yes, absolutely. I would agree with that, yeah. But then the, the second question I have is a technical one, which is um, normally I think about uh, using, say, Lindblad master equations to, to understand these loss effects uh, rather than the non-Hermitian formalism. And my understanding is that non-Hermitian formalism does not capture, say, pure defacing effects where you don't lose amp you don't lose amplitude, you, you don't lose populations, but you still lose phase. Can you comment a little bit about, say, what um, what could you, like, is it essential to think about the master equation or this non-Hermitian formalism, which looks a bit simpler to implement, capture a lot of things? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I, I don't really think I'm going to have an adequate answer to that question, though. Um, I, I, I think I, I think it, though it's, it, it is worth it is worth stating that there are certain attractive features, you know, um, of the Lindblad formalism that um, you know one is that your wave function doesn't lose norm, for example. So so we actually had to kind of do some funky things um, in the surface hopping approach to um, to to really think about. Uh, Hopping probability, um, like to the to the G zero state, for example, because the you know the, there, it's it's not actually it's not actually the case with the non Hermitian formalism that you transfer a population to the G zero state, for example, like you would in the Lindblad. But the, as far as incorporating dephasing effects with the non Hermitian Hamiltonian, I, I actually I, I can't really comment. But but I think it's a good question, and I I know there are people that think about it. So. Yeah, I think you, you do get defacing, right? Because you are relaxing amplitude. The only thing is that like pure defacing, I don't know if my, 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 my intuition says, I think you don't get the pure defacing, but I'm not, I, I haven't really thought much about this. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Sure, thank you. All right, well, we also have a question in the Q&A. Uh, all right, so. It's from Arkajit Mandel. So the question is, since the fact that the derivative coupling comes zero at high loss, uh, it will make the upper plareton isolated from lower plareton. Yes. Parentheses, no non adiabatic transition. Now, if their dynamics, as is done here, is confined on only the UP, will there be a discontinuity of force due to a cusp between UP and LP? Ah, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, I, I think I'm not positive, uh, but my, my suspicion is that, um, um, it, so I have, I have these, right, these, um, these splittings, right, the imaginary splittings, for example, and the, um, as the law, and you, there is there is actually a little bit, you know, what, what kind of appears to be a little bit of a, a cusp in the imaginary energy space, and there's there is a little bit of a, a, a kind of a funky feature to the the real energy curves at, at the region of the intersection. But at the same time, I think the derivative coupling is still finite, and I think what would basically happen is if you if you really approach the infinite loss, right, you just have like literally no coupling, uh, derivative coupling is zero. Um, and you don't have these these features anymore, right? It's just sort of like a, a flat line. The lower polariton has all the loss. Um, the upper polariton has zero loss because it's literally just the 
the um, E0 state, right? And the lower Flareton is literally just the G1 state. And, um, and so then it really just looks like, um, you know, um, your azobenzene uh, molecular system and there happens to be a photon around, right? And it's not interacting. That's, that's kind of what I would, my intuition for like the extreme limit of those things is no, and, and no, dis no discontinuities in the force or anything like that. All right, uh, do we have any more questions from the audience? All right, well, if not, please thank Professor Foley again for a very nice talk. And now before we end, I'd like to make a quick announcement. So I'm gonna share my screen. All right, so please join us for next week's webinar uh, featuring Professor Angel Rubio from Max Planck. And he'll be talking about cavity control of two-dimensional materials phenomena, cavity twistronics. All right, well, thank you so much for attending today's webinar and have a very nice rest of the week. All right, bye everyone.